Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Aina Rinderman. Hello, Aina, how are you doing? Oh, fine, yes. It's some hot days here and hot and rainy and humid, but I'm very fine now. Okay, so Aina, I've been waiting to get you for a long time and we're going to have a, an excellent chat. First, we will start to talk about some research that you have done on experts and how they view intelligence and the causes of international differences in intelligence. And you have been doing yeah. these studies for several years, Aina. What is the consensus? Do experts believe that IQ is irritable and impacted by genetics? Um, when you speak of the individual level, um, the experts agree that there's a huge amount of variance of individual differences can be explained by um, a genetic factor, but we do not know what genes, or we usually do not know the exact genes uh, which contribute uh, to uh, individual differences. We, and there are several studies, some are replicated showing um, that some genes have a minor impact on individual differences, but we have a, a gap, we have a knowledge gap between um, a very sound, very sound evidence for uh, a general genetic factor explaining individual differences and the, we have only uh, some knowledge on which genes are causing these individual differences. All right, but I know. You, you, you gave you a number more, about 70 to 80% for adults um, of individual differences we can explain by an unknown or more or less unknown genetic facts. All right, but I know there are over 500 genes that are linked to intelligence according to recent research. So at some point we will have a better understanding of how genes yeah. impact intelligence. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we, we, are, we are waiting for this since, since about 10 to 20 years to, 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 uh, to find the genes or the genetic pattern to at least explain about 40, 50 percent of individual difference. But we are we are now not not so. Our our knowledge is not so far. Now. Okay, and the Aina, I am also interested in how culture can drive the genetics of intelligence. So, for example, personality traits like intelligence are irritable. Therefore, is it? possible that some G, that some traits that do not promote educational attainment are irritable and as a result this can partially explain IQ gaps um, you are asking whether cultural factors can explain individual differences in intelligence is this correct well not quite I'm, I'm saying that personality is also irritable like intelligent so yes. Maybe yeah. some traits that do not promote educational attainment are being inherited, and this can partially explain IQ gaps. So, for example, grit is highly irritable. What is highly irritable? I did not grit, understand. grit, grit. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, so, yes, so, yes, so, yes. so, for example, we mm -hmm. often talk about acting white or the culture of poverty. So my thesis is that some cultural groups are passing on traits that are antithetical to educational attainment. I've never tested it. I've never seen a study along this line. So I'm wondering if this could actually be a possibility. Yes, also personality has also a high heritability or shows high heritability coefficients. And what we usually explain in individual differences by um, culture or more, more precisely by personality or by family or by behavior. Uh, this could be also hidden genetic effects. That, that's correct. Yes, I, I would love to see a study along that line because I, I do believe that to an extent, some groups possess traits that are not favorable to academic achievement. And the... Mm -hmm. And the Heiner, you also published a study, and I think that it is quite interesting. It's on smart fractions. Heiner, what do we mean by smart fraction? A smart fraction, intellectual groups, intellectual classes, cognitive classes, high ability persons, the gifted uh, persons with a higher cognitive ability level 
uh, who show a large impact of, uh, on the development of technology, of, of uh, administrations, of improvement of administrations, of running administrations, of um, um, uh, achieving high um, uh, better results in the leading companies and so on. Also, uh, the gifted um, uh, who are working um, or are especially working in cognitive and demanding and environment, cognitive environments and cognitive demanding uh, jobs. All right. And on average, do smart fractions. Some, some oh, there are, there's a smart fractions is a, is a term, or um, I use another term cognitive glasses, electrical glasses, or um, rocket scientists are used by um, economists or the creative class. And there, there are different terms for um, this group. Okay, then. And on average, do smart fractions produce more than ordinary people? Um, they have a, um, oh, 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 go, 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 go to my research and, and when I compare um, the economic productivity, the income of um, societies, of countries, um, the cognitive ability level of intellectual glasses, of smart fractions, it can better explain country differences in uh, productivity, in income, in wealth. Um, than the average um, ability level of uh, society. And in path analysis, we can show that the impact on income, on economic productivity, productivity and goes via um, production, higher production, better production in STEM fields, um, in science, in technology, in engineering, in math, in um, developing more patterns in producing more um, competitive uh, high technology um, uh, um, goods which can be exported uh, and so on. And inferring from these results, uh, we assume that the uh, cognitive glasses have an, uh, a larger effect on uh, producing wealth um, than and the average classes or low ability classes. But this is an uh, interpretation. Another interpretation would be that, for example, that the readability level of the uh, cognitive ability uh, of smart fractions of intellectual classes is higher. And that because the readability level of our measures is better, we can better explain country differences in these variables. But we can show or our research has shown that the, for example, the um, ability level of the uh, less smart classes of the lowest 5% um, better explains country differences, for example, in HIV or in uh, some aspects of crime. And uh, based on these results, we assume that's not the reliability differences, um, which or the, that the, the higher correlation, the higher in impact of the ability level of smart glasses is not due to the higher reliability of this measurement, but due to the impact of these glasses on technology development, on quality of administration and so on, and at the end producing a higher wealth. Okay, thanks. And Einar, do these smart fractions in developed countries produce more than their peers in developing countries? The ability level in, in developed countries is on average higher and including of the uh, smart fractions of the intellectual classes. And based on um, this uh, observation and based on um, uh, possible output variables like technology development, patent rates, and so on. Um, we assume that the uh, positive effect of intellectual glasses on society um, is larger in developed countries than in, in developing countries. But this does not mean that uh, intellectual glasses are not important for um, developing countries. Maybe they are even more important uh, because an improvement in the ability level in these 
countries, special intellectual classes can have a huge impact on the positive development of their societies in administration, in, um, uh, in companies, in universities, and so on. All right. But Rinderman, what about the role of culture? So, for example, Jaladi, Jaladi in his research argues that openness and autonomy are correlated with innovation. So I've, I've often argued that developing countries on the average are less open to ideas they're, and they're also more collectivistic and furthermore, their institutions may not be as effective. So could the the intellectual production gap between the smart fraction in rich countries and poor countries be explainable by cultural and institutional factors? Mm. Yes, and uh, yes, this could be. Um, um, we see, uh, for example, uh, um, when we measure religion and what can be attributed to religion as a cultural factor, we see that for um, the for political variables, culture is at least, if not more important um, than cognitive variables. For example, for explaining differences between countries in democracy or in human rights, culture is more relevant than uh, cognitive um, ability, including the cognitive ability level of intellectual classes. Culture is not only important for explaining um, um, political differences between uh, countries, but also uh, at least partly for explaining um, cognitive ability differences between countries because culture has an effect on education, on education in schools, on education in uh, families, and we are these indirect effects as an effect on um, a cognitive uh, ability. For example, Protestantism has a um, positive impact on reading, special reading of, um, of women. And this, we are reading, we are more, via more education, um, uh, culture, or here in this case, uh, Protestantism has a positive impact on uh, cognitive ability of a country. And indirectly, it's also Protestantism has, for, has, for example, a positive effect on um, minorities, on Catholic uh, person in such countries, or and the more Christians in Africa, in a country, the so higher is the education level of Muslims in such a country because there are indirect environmental effects, quality of environment on schools and in institutions, also for other groups in a society. Thanks again. And the Rinderman, I would like to know if the propensity of intelligent people in developing countries to produce is impeded by national IQ. So for example, according to one researcher, for R&D investments to be profitable, IQ should be around 90. As a result, intelligent people are more appreciative of R&D results. Therefore, in highly intelligent people in developing countries may not be motivated to engage in R&D. For example, a politician in a developing country may not lobby for R&D grants and research and development because the population is unable to, to appreciate the long-term benefits of scientific development. Yes, that, 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 that could be, yes, because um, the benefits of um, IQ depends on, on the environment. Um, just imagine in a a tribal society, um, high IQ um, doesn't have that a positive impact because the institutions and the um, gratification systems are not uh, or less developed or less beneficial uh, for those persons. If you don't have a university or don't have huge companies or a professional administration, a cognitive ability is less variable um, uh, for the person. Yes, that's correct. We have let me let, let me refer to a study I've done with Tom Coyle from um, the University of Texas in San Antonio, and we have shown that um, the higher the economic freedom in a country and the larger the positive impact of um, cognitive ability of the average cognitive ability of a country on economic productivity and especially the higher is the positive impact of quantitative of the intellectual classes on 
economic productivity. So we see that the more liberal a country, economic liberal country, the more positive is the impact of intelligence uh, on uh, wealth. Uh, well, I know I was actually planning to discuss that paper eventually, but we will get back to it. But for the moment, we're still on your first paper exploring the relationship between smart factions and IQ. Einar, in your paper, you refer to democracy. Do democracies promote cognitive ability? Demo um, democracies. In your paper, you, you argue that democracies could have a positive impact on cognitive ability. Ah, yeah, yes, yes. Now, now I understand. The, the positive impact of democracy on cognitive ability is rather uh, small. We have a large impact of uh, rule of law, a positive impact of rule of law on cognitive ability because we assume that in a, uh, a country with higher level of rule of law, um, the uh, society is more meritoric or um, the institutions are in a way organized that there's a closer relationship between achievement and outcome. And uh, social success, for example, is less depending on uh, contacts, on um, riches or political affiliations or family affiliations and more based on individual uh, achievement. All right. So rule of law, rule of law, um, supports that um, achievement leads to success and not you have a, you have success we are um, connections or we are bribes and so on. So therefore the impact of democracy on cognitive ability is indirect. Um, Yes, in, indirect. We, we, we are, when we are dealing with um, those variables in the at the country level, we uh, always assume that there are indirect effects, mediators, uh, which are uh, producing those relationships. So, for example, demo democracies on average are more toler tolerant than dictatorships. So maybe cognitive ability is more evident in democratic societies because people have an avenue to socialize and tolerate dissident opinions. Yes, yes, that's a, that's a, that's a good um, a hypothesis. Yes, this could be yes. Mm -hmm. And I know there is a statement in your study that is quite interesting and I read the cognitive ability of political of political leaders is far less important. I'm looking at the statement because some studies do show that the education of leaders actually matters for long term development. Yes, but Simon, Simon is an, uh, an important researcher of the United States in, in these fields and we, we cannot show a huge impact um, or we do not see a close relationship between cognitivity level of politicians and the fate of societies. We have a much closer relationship between average ability level and the ability level of intellectual classes in general, but less of politicians. One reason could be that we do not have good measures of cognitive ability of politicians. We use usually um, educational degrees and um, uh, the quality of educational degrees for uh, indicating cognitive ability is is not is not uh, high. Is not this, they are not uh, really reliable um, uh, measures. For example, if you have a, a an university degree in uh, Britain and in in France and in I don't know in Egypt and in uh, uh, Uruguay, um, you have you have you have formally the same um, degree, but can we really compare um, the um, the ability levels um, which they indicate, or can we compare ability levels um, of, um, um, derived on university degrees um, stemming from different American universities? This is this is uh, problematic. Well, some studies exploring yeah, the let me let, let me give a positive um, um, example um, from Lee Kuan Yew, the former leader from uh, um, Singapore. Singapore. We have here uh, 
very good indicators for high cognitive ability level of him because he, when I remember correctly, he was in Cambridge and he studied there and he has uh, received there some awards or, or similar and um, also based on what he is um, saying and how he was arguing in political um, uh, statements um, and talks and so on, um, we can infer the, a high cognitive ability level and we can and we compare this to the um, the positive development of Singapore, um, the positive economic and um, technological development of Singapore um, and during his time of uh, leadership, uh, we, we can see that uh, there's a connection between cognitive ability level of a politician and uh, positive development uh, of a country. Yes, I, I read this is a, this is a positive, positive positive um, example, but we do not have so many um, good, scientifically spoken, good examples for low and high ability levels from many countries. Okay, then. All right. I, I read Lee Kuan, Lee Kuan Yu's book some years ago, and I do remember mm -hmm. Lee Kuan Yu encouraging bright men to marry smart women. <laughs> yeah, Lee mm -hmm. Kuan Yu was a genius. I'm, I'm a big fan of Lee Kuan Yew. And we know that Lee Kuan Yew is smart because if we rely on benchmarking as a proxy for intelligence, Lee Kuan Yew is exceptionally brilliant. Lee Kuan Yew studied the policies of several countries and then applied the more suitable policies to develop Singapore. And that's unusual mm -hmm. in the developing world. Yes, he, he also recepted and the results of intelligence research very very exceptional for political leaders. But back to our main point, the role of education and leadership. Some researchers contend that leaders from developing countries are more productive, not necessarily because they studied abroad, but due to network effects. So if you studied at Harvard, more than likely you'd have developed relationships with powerful people. And as such, by relocating to your to your home country, you can rely on these net networks and avenues. Mm -hmm. yeah. let, let it put me more, or let put it, uh, or give you a broader uh, frame. Um, I've shown um, in studies and also other researchers have shown this, that the average ability level of your environment, especially of the um, school environment, the class environment in at school. If you are, if it's, if students, pupils are going um, to schools with on average smarter students, or are going into classes with on average smarter um, uh, other students in this class, this has a positive impact on the quality of instruction in this class and then. A longitudinal positive impact on the individual development of intelligence. So the smarter your um, social environment, the smart, the better is your um, uh, cognitive development. The uh, uh, intelligent environment makes people uh, intelligent. Intelligent people make other people intelligent. And this gets now to your network effects. If you are going to to uh, um, um, university with a high cognitive ability level of their students, especially I would say for Caltech, Caltech in the United States um, is selecting students only based, as far as I know, only based on achievement and cognitive ability and measures and not on political criteria and so on. So you have here a very smart social environment around you. And this has a positive effect on the quality of instruction, the positive effect on the quality of communication. And this uh, has a um, longitudinal positive effect on individual cognitive development. I agree with you, Einar. Let me give a personal example. So I attended a school in Jamaica where for the most part, the students were pretty smart. When I was 13, I, I had classmates who were talking about the G8, students in grade seven were discussing the cultural revolution in China. So I was motivated to do well in school and beyond the external motivation, intrinsically, I am a motivated person. Then I went to university and I was fortunate to be instructed by really 
bright lecturers, but on average, the students I encountered at university were not as exceptional as my peers in high school. So I did fairly well if you're judging passes as a student, but looking back, maybe I would have done better if my classmates were more intelligent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I you may I go ahead. Yeah, I spoke about positive impact of the cognitive ability level of the social environment on cognitive development, but I did not speak about possible negative impacts on self-concept. Um, if you are surrounded by many smart people, you, you estimate your own intelligence or your own ability level less than if you are surrounded by less smart people. The less, the, the less smart the people around you, the more you feel yourself more intelligent and this has a positive impact on self-concept and a higher self-concept um, uh, leads to uh, for example a higher or a better or more achieving more um, demanding goals um, uh, because you think oh you are so smart um, and you can achieve more difficult uh, goals so we have a positive impact on ability development of the intelligence level of around you or ability level around you and the negative impact on uh, self-concept. But a downside of surrounding yourself with less intelligent people is that is that you're not motivated to perform at a higher level. So for example, if little Johnny is in a class and he's the smartest student, his self-esteem will be bo boosted. But if little Johnny migrates to America and study at Harvard, his self-esteem may decline because when he was in country white, he was never forcing himself to become more intelligent. So in the long term, the implications could be negative. Yes, it could be negative on self-concept or usually the research show their negative effects on self-concept and, and on um, factors or criteria based on self-concept like uh, goals and positive effect on ability itself. All right then. Now I, I, I know we're going to talk about your paper, the Co Cognitive Capitalism, Economic Freedom Moderates the Effects of Intellectual and Average Classes on Economic Productivity. You may tell us a little about it. Yes, this was a paper I published together in 2016 with Tom Coyle, who was the first author of Tom Coyle, is a psychologist at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And we have shown that, I will now open this, we have shown that the cognitive ability level of a society and of the intellectual classes is closer related to economic criteria, um, uh, is closer related to, to productivity and income and wealth in more economic free countries. So, so we, or we interpret, we understand this, that in a more economic liberal countries, the, the positive effects of intelligence are boosted. Because uh -huh. the society is more meritoric, meritocratic, because a close relationship between individual, individual achievement and individual outcome in life. Institutions may probably institutions uh, work better, but this we have not studied. And another aspect is that free market economies promote transparency, trust, and they are less bu bureaucratic. Bureaucracies, in a sense, deter innovation because in a free market, you are able to judge your, your work based on how people respond or perceive the product. But in a bureaucracy, the quality of your product is politically determined by a bureaucrat who may not have insight into how the market works. Yes, yes, that's correct. Yes, very fine. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. so for example, mm -hmm. Russia. I've been researching Russia for a while and Russia, based on its scientific output, can be considered to be a fairly intelligent country. But when you compare Russia to Singapore, Singaporeans are more likely to patent. So why are Russians unable to translate education into human capital? So education is getting the degree in engineering. Human capital is starting a company like Amazon. I did not understand oh, at the last two sentences or what, what No, no, say? I said I I said 
you 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 human capital is starting a major company like Google. Education yeah. is getting the degree. So Russians are adept at scientific research, but can they translate research into human capital? So Singap Singaporeans, for example, patent yeah. more than Russians. Yeah. Um, put it more broadly, we have, what we have seen is that um, that uh, from Eastern Europe, including Russia, but also Ukraine, are emigrating intellectual classes to America and to Australia, and that they are they are more successful than in their usually usually more successful than in the home country. Uh, and the best example is the uh, founder of uh, WhatsApp, who was very poor in uh, Ukraine and, uh, and also when he came to the United States and then he got very rich because he had a, a, a very good idea and in the American um, environment, in the economic free country, capitalist country, this could show uh, positive results, and, but less in, um, in Russia or less in, in other former uh, Soviet Union countries. And we, uh, we see the causes in a, in a less free, less meritocratic, meritoric um, uh, structure um, of uh, the uh, former Soviet um, um, uh, countries. Of course, the but, 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 but let, let, oh, let, let me add something. You know, what, what we should do, or what, what others should do, is to make some biographical research on how people in the past get rich in Russia or in Ukraine. And it seems to be that they get especially rich by having had connections um, to the political class and having some special knowledge um, where um, in the transition process from a communist to a capitalist or more capitalist country, um, where are companies uh, which can be um, uh, bought or which can be um, taken uh, taken by their by their by some by the management and so on. And with using this knowledge and these connections, um, they could um, accumulate a lot of uh, wealth. But it was less innovation, and it was less um, um, less work on which others in the social environment also benefit from. It's more more um, knowledge and behavior to see um, in, to find niches where you can uh, appropriate um, the given wealth and less produce new uh, additional wealth and which can also have positive effect on the society or on others. All right. It's more, it's more a question of distribution, how, how you can find in a given society where you can have access to wealth and and take this unless to find new ways to to invent to to produce new ideas um, to, to um, develop new products and um, which have all also a positive impact on a positive effect on others and obviously the exodus of intellectuals and scientists to western economies during the cold war has a positive impact yeah. on development even today. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, um, oh. I don't know uh, studies showing the positive impact of- John Russians. Glad, J John Glad did a study ah, on ah. communist mi migrants. John, John, Glad, John ah, yeah. Glad who died, he had a study, but he's quite old. Ah, yeah. Yes, okay, then, then I, have to, I have to look at papers of him again or, or more closely, but we know from um, the um, Nazi time in Germany that the Jewish immigration um, to America and I think also to Britain has had a positive impact on the development of science there. Yes, yeah, so for example, 
Einar, what, what about World War II? I, I'm, I would be willing to read a study looking at the, rela at the relationship between intelligence and America's success during World War II because America benefited from a bout of intelligence scholars from European countries. Yes, yes. So, um, there's, there's, a, there's some, some study I mentioned it from um, emigrated um, Jewish German scientists to the United States who have had a positive impact on the development of science in their fields and on the productivity of American researchers in, in, in those fields. For example, there's, there's a um, German Jewish um, um, uh, researcher in chemistry and he went to the United States and then he had there some assistance and so on and local assistance from America and there these assistance in, in the future have shown um, a better work and higher productivity compared to assistance of um, uh, local American professors. Yeah. Would America uh, emerge as a superpower had it not been for immigrants? Uh, this is a testable hypothesis. <laughs> yeah, um, when I say there's a positive e effect and I re rely on research of, um, of, of colleagues, um, this does not necessarily mean that um, United States would have not had a positive development in science and in technology development and so on without any um, immigration. This we could not uh, infer. We can only show that the immigration um, amplified of, the, uh, the, the process has had a positive impact. But without them, maybe United States in any way would have would have had uh, a positive development. I agree, but immigrants amplify the, the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, this, this, this we can say, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, Einar, Singapore IQ is rather high, but recently yeah. Diego Coleman was on the show and Diego Coleman said that te technological breakthroughs are still likely to occur in the West. So despite the intelligence of Singaporeans, he's unable to name one significant technology that was created in Singapore. What's, yeah. so, what's so, going on? Yeah. First of all, Singapore is, is a very is a rather small country, um, but uh, we have a, we have we, or we have same observations for China and Japan that the we have a high or Taiwan we have a high ability level in all East Asian countries, but the scientific achievement, including cultural achievement, uh, since decades or since centuries, is higher in the West uh, with on average uh, a somewhat two to five IQ, IQ point um, lower ability level. Yes, that's true. And uh, we see here that not only, um, or we assume that the measurement of ability in, in East Asia, including Singapore and Western country is a reliable, so that the difference, there's a real difference in cognitive level favoring East Asia. <clears throat> we, we do not think this is the, that this is based or that, the, that we have an underestimation of cognitive ability in the West and an overestimation of cognitive ability in the East. But we think other factors are relevant for scientific, scientific production. For example, if you invent something new, you have to um, cross borders. You have to um, give up formal knowledge. You have to be a little bit um, re re revolutionary in your um, in your behavior and in your thinking. And East Asian um, societies, peoples are compared to um, Western people's more collectivistic, they are more conservative, less individualistic, less rebellious, less revolutionary. And, um, uh, but you need this um, personality and cultural aspect too to be really an innovative 
um, thinker or scientist. Let me give you some, or let, let me drop some names. For example, Friedrich Nietzsche or the German philosopher or Karl Marx, German Jewish um, philosopher or um, Albert Einstein or, or many others. You do not have such figures in um, East Asian or Beethoven or Verdi and so on uh, as composers. We, we do not have such figures in East Asian countries and the, um, um, the interpretation is that uh, they are uh, less individualistic and less uh, um, independent, less, less willing and able to um, transgress to um, to cross um, uh, former knowledge, former standard behavior, former standard thinking. I agree with you. We often depreciate the primacy, primacy of personality traits like openness and individualism in explaining the innovation gap. East Asians yeah. score lower on measures of openness and individualism. And some studies do show that genes that are linked to novelty seeking are more prevalent in Western societies. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. And the, the interpretation or some historical evolutionary interpretation is that uh, rice farming um, is based on, is more based on a collectivist um, uh, working or uh, um, organizational pattern than um, farming of um, wheat. Yeah, wheat. Yes. Yes. Then this is this is the one explanation. You wheat individual uh, farmers can produce, but rice farming is not possible or less possible in a in an individual way. Uh, you need a whole. Um, um, uh, group of people, entire group of people uh, producing this. And another point is that Westerners have a more theoretical culture than Easterners. Yeah. So for example, one writer notes that Westerners display a preference for formal reasoning in contrast to Easterners who exhibit a preference for intuitive reasoning. Yeah, yes, yes, that, that's correct. Um, um, that the Western style of thinking is more theoretical and the Eastern style of thinking is more pragmatical um, oriented towards problem solving why the Westerners are more systemizing and producing large buildings of thought and uh, compared to uh, Eastern people. Yes, that's correct. So for example, J J Japan for several years has been in the economic doldrum. It's not as bad as other countries because Japan has a relatively high save, saving, saving rate, but for mm -hmm. the most part, the economy has been sluggish. China, on the other hand, is, is, in, is improving, but the Chinese are still not as radical in terms of personality like Westerners. So there's yeah. Alibaba, but as one writer for a business magazine noted recently, collectivism can only take you so far. At some point, countries need to become radically innovative in order yeah. to revolutionize society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm I pretty- don't, I don't know. Let, let, let us compare with, um, Alibaba with Amazon. Is there anything in Alibaba which is more innovative compared to Amazon? I, I don't know. I, I think- well, I, Alibaba I is- Alibaba mm -hmm. is, is the tech giant in East Asia. So you're, you're right. Yeah. Uh, Amazon was the first mover. So Amazon revolutionized the market and then companies like Alibaba followed. So again, yes. you're correct. Uh, Alibaba is benefiting from the second mover advantage. So yes, correct. Based, right. based on this observation, Alibaba is innovative in the Eastern sense, but not innovative more broadly. Yes, not in a worldwide sense. That's correct, and they are very successful in in or, or taking more broad on the the Chinese and Japanese are very successful in adapting ideas and 
making ideas in the local and also in the worldwide context uh, productive, but not they are um, very innovative in a revolutionary way. Yeah, and in China, bureaucrats are still powerful. Where cloth is just yeah. unnecessary. Yes, I think there was a, in the last weeks there was a, was in the news that the that the boss of Alibaba disappeared for some time. You know, so, so people for political reasons he disappeared, and we see that um, why uh, while um, the the boss of Amazon is going to the. Uh, to the skies, yes, yes, this the boss of the Alibaba is disappearing in, in Nauru, some prisons or so on and so on. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, because to a large extent, success in China is still dependent on network effects and the yeah. ability Political to inspire network. the state. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. Ch China is yet to get rid of rent seeking or what the British would call yeah. old corruption. Yeah, yeah, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. No. I know we're going to move on to discuss your paper titled What Goes Into High Educational and Occupational Achievement? Education, Brains, Hard Work, Networks, and Other Factors. Einer, is practice really that important? Mm. Let, 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 me, let me first say um, some words on the, uh, on the authors. Um, I have, I'm the co-author of this paper and Jonathan Wei uh, from the University of Arkansas. He was the first author and uh, we published this uh, paper together. And what we have shown, we have shown that uh, the leaders in, in, in the media, in companies and administration are, are or high fraction and disproportionately are stemming from elite universities where they um, have had their, um, or where they achieved their higher education. And based on SAT or ACT measures, um, average um, averages um, uh, of students in these university, uh, we inferred that a high cognitive ability level indicated by the average Vulnerability <clears throat> levels of these students has a positive impact on success in different uh, um, realms of uh, of production in the media, in administration, politics, uh, in the industry, and and so on. And but I have also shown. Let me let me two two, two sentences more. Speaking about networks effects, if you go to um, uh, a leading university, you have not um, you have not only shown that you have a usually you have not only shown that you have a high, high cognitive ability level. If the um, if the process to admit students is based on ability and not on political criteria, you have not only shown that you have a high um, cognitive ability level. You have also shown that you can adapt to educational um, standards you have to be you have to have you have to show grit you have to be a conscious person you have to adapt what the people in the educational institution expect from you you have to be at least to a certain degree social adaptive um, and you don't have also positive cognitive selection you have a positive personality selection and you benefit from the ability and personality attributes of your social environment. You get to know the people who are later on successful. They are your friends and they help. They help the people that they have known or friends um, or other friends in their uh, university. And you benefit from the nimbus, from the, um, from the name, from the brand uh, of the university. And you have been, uh, when you have been on our famous university, um, later on, you will have better chances to find a job or a better paid job or a job with higher influence than if you went on a university with a less known uh, um, name. All right, Einar. And remember, I, I pose the question, will practicing make us exceptional? And in your piece, there is a fascinating snippet. In fact, 
in their meta analysis across a var variety of domains, Oswald et al. 2014 found that deliberate practice accounted for only 4% of the variance in education and less than 1% of the variance in occupations, leaving mm -hmm. much remaining variance unaccounted for. Hence, practicing can enable us to improve performance, but practicing will not make us a Bill Gates. <laughs> yes, yeah, this is uh, the, the old, old um, a dispute between nature and nurture. Nurture is practicing in, um, in nature is, are the genes and what is more important for explaining um, differences in success. And usually we, we show uh, research is showing that um, the nature effects are much larger on explaining individual differences in success than the uh, nurture effects. And two sentences more. Many studies show a huge impact or correlation, relationship between parental family attributes and the success of children. We see a high correlation between family wealth, family income, socioeconomic status, family um, educational degrees, parental educational degrees, and the later success of um, the children. And in the media and frequently also in science, this is interpreted as an environmental family effect. But that is, that is not true. Family, um, parents um, not only contribute to the success of their children via, via um, improving or changing the environment, the quality in which um, children grew up, but also via direct genetic effects. And usually in the parental effects, the parental educational effect and the parental <coughs> income wealth effect is not a environmental effect, but a hidden um, genetic effect. And the Einer, in one of your previous studies, you also argue that the educational accomplishments of parents are more important to the success of your children than socioeconomic status. So yes. again, you are correct. Genes are quite important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we have shown in a study in about 10 countries, um, including United States, Vietnam, Austria, um, Costa Rica, uh, Ecuador, um, I think also um, uh, Brazil. Um, we have shown that there's a closer relationship, a higher correlation between um, at the educational level of parents and children's intelligence than between the parental income level and uh, the cognitive ability of uh, children. So we can better predict the intelligence level of children by parental de educational degrees than by parental income. But what does it mean or what, what is meaning this correlation? It means that we can better predict what we cannot theoretically explain because we have um, a connection, yeah, a, a mixture of genetic and environmental effects of parents on children. What we need, we, are, we need twin studies to which disentangle um, genetic, general genetic and general environmental effect. We, um, in twin studies, we can show that uh, a larger amount of variance can be explained by global genetic factors compared to global environmental factors in uh, children's cognitive development in, development in children's individual differences in uh, intelligence. Okay, and uh, Einar, earlier in the discussion, we both referred to network effects and their present paper explores the role of networking in explaining success. But Einar, mm -hmm. are intelligent people superior at networking? <laughs> I think so. Mm -hmm. um, I I'm thinking about this. I don't. Let, let me tell you. Let me tell you why I share this opinion. 
In order to network, one must be able to add value. Showing up at a networking effect is a waste of time if you are unable to add value. So for example, if one is a scientist, you should attend networking effects, you should attend networking events for scientists and business people because business people have the funds to commercialize research. But if you're a scientist who is not interested in literature, you shouldn't show up at an event for professors who teach literature. Secondly, intelligent people are more likely to, to network at a superior level because they're open to intellectual ideas and new experiences. So for example, if I live in Nigeria, I can network with people in Germany. Intelligent people, because of their scope, do not perceive barriers to networking. So this is one reason why intelligent people may be more adept at networking than less intelligent people. Yeah. You, you assume that more intelligent people behave in a more intelligent way. And this includes selecting friends, colleagues um, from which they benefit. This is a, this is a, a global assumption we have. Um, intelligent people behave in a more intelligent way, um, including um, benefiting their own um, career and development. But I do not really know studies showing this. And, and we, have a, we have also, we have not only intelligence as a variable, but we have also personality. And um, um, it could be that there's a relationship between intelligence and a less um, social um, or sociability uh, behavior. This is there's a, not a very strong, but there's a weak <clears throat> positive correlation between um, intelligence and less time invested in social in relationships. They are more interested in many intelligent people are more interested in things and doing their work and reading and so on. And to be a good networker, <clears throat> you have to write many emails and meet people and go to bars and so on. And the more time that you invest in such networks, networking, the less time you invest in science and reading and thinking and so on. So there's a time, time, conquer, uh, time competition between social work and work on intellectual subjects. So you can combine it if you go, for example, to a conference or if you speak with um, about intellectual subjects and so on, but there's some time competition. Intelligence is modulated by personality. So for example, smart people will invest in science and research to a greater degree, but smarter people acknowledge the benefits of networking. Yeah, yeah, this is what I, what I first said that intelligent people behave in a more intelligent way and see the benefits of, uh, of selected or of communication with well-selected people. They do not speak a lot, a long time with less smart people, but they speak a lot with other smart people from which they benefit. You're right. So for example, to make money on YouTube, it requires intelligence and social skills, but I give the edge to social skills. Most mm -hmm. people are relatable. I'm introverted. I don't like showing my face. I'm only showing my face because you requested it. But yes. in, order, in order to generate serious revenue on YouTube, you must demonstrate that you're able to interact with the audience and I'm not very interactive. Therefore, for someone like myself, it makes sense to target people like you who are highly intelligent. And interestingly, though my sh videos are usually over one hour and the professors tend to be a bit technical, my show started in March, it wasn't consistent. And now this, I have over 700 subscribers. So I guess there is a market for what I'm doing. Yeah, yes, yes. And there are many other people producing high quality um, YouTube, uh, videos or smart interviews and so on like you and there's a there's a growing market and for us there are more and more possibilities to be surrounded by a productive and um, stimulating um, 
um, environment. For example, by selecting um, YouTube videos which from which we can learn something. But but to make money on YouTube as someone who's highly intelligent, yeah. it's better to be famous. So if you're a famous yeah. person, then you can start a video and it will gain traction. But as an average yeah. person, it is really hard. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But we're, mm -hmm. we're going to move on and talk about genetic distances. What is the relationship between genetic distance and IQ? And what is genetic distance? Um, genetic distance is a... Uh, is a variable or genetic uh, similarity or affinity the, the, other, the other way around describes uh, whether two persons are genetic similar or two people are genetic similar. Um, we have used this um, uh, approach at the country level. So we compared um, peoples of countries in their genetic similarity or genetic distance. And for example, Germans, we know they are very similar to Czech people and to, uh, as far as I know, the, the most genetically similar people of the Germans are Czech people and then probably Scandinavian people or British people and so on. And there's a large or huge genetic distance to um, originally in Australia or um, Africans in Africa um, or um, American Indians, American natives um, and so on. So you can compare countries in their genetic similarity and for example, um, people in um, Argentina are closer related to people in Spain than to people in Russia or people in China and so on. And what we have shown is that genet the more similar um, people are, peoples, countries, or the peoples of countries are in, in genes, the more similar um, those countries are in uh, the results of, of student achievement studies like PISA, or TIMS or PERLs or in cognitive ability intelligence studies, psychometric intelligence studies like collected by, by Richard Lynn and, and David uh, Becker. And based on this, we assume because um, genetically more similar peoples are more similar in um, their cognitive ability levels and controlled for um, similarity in uh, human development index, uh, we infer that also genetic effects contribute to um, uh, cognitive ability differences, differences or similarities um, between countries. So there's a genetic effect uh, or, or genetic factors uh, um, which can help us to understand why countries differ in intelligence. This is one approach to show that genes play a role um, explaining in country differences in cognitive ability. Excellent. And uh, Einar, I've discussed this matter on a few occasions, but I'm happy that you are privy to the research. So Michael Woodley of Mini did a study on Apple groups, and he argues that long-term evolutionary selections do explain intelligence in some parts of Europe. Briefly comment on that study. Yeah, this is a study um, Michael Woodley and I have uh, done um, together showing that um, we, can ex we can statistically explain um, to a certain extent intelligence differences between European or among European and Northern African and um, um, West Asian countries, also Arabian countries in this group, Europe, European, North African and Arabian countries. In this group, we can explain um, intelligence differences between countries to a certain degree by haplogroups. And haplogroups are genes that which are not coding intelligence, which are not relevant for cognitive ability differences at the individual or country level. They are indicators of the evolutionary past. So 
persons who differ on haplogroups groups or people who differ on haplogroups groups, they have a um, different um, evolutionary past and showing such a correlation between evolutional indicators and cognitive ability um, is another indicator um, for the assumption that international differences in cognitive ability can at least be explained by genetic factors. And these pressures are evolutionary and long-term. So for example, yes, Einer- but, but, but let me repeat, we do not, by, the, by genetic differences, as well as haplogroups, we have not find, found the special genes um, and their impact on neurological development on intelligence. But we have an indirect indicator for genetic factors explaining inter international differences in cognitive ability. Exactly, Einer. And some years ago, you also produced a paper on intelligence in Africa. And, I'm, and, and the, I am sure that my listeners would love to hear the evolutionary explanation for lower IQ scores in Africa. So, um, in our study on... The paper is titled African Cognitive Ability, Research yeah, Results, yeah. Divergences, and Recommendations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, in the, the paper on, done with David Becker to, to, together on genetic um, differences or genetic distances and genetic similarity, there were also included African countries and uh, we can show that also for African countries, um, genetic similarity has a positive in, in impact on cognitive similarity at the uh, country level. We do not have a special evolutionary theory for Africa, but we have very robust results that the average ability level in Sub-Saharan Africa is compared to uh, Western or especially East Asian countries is uh, quite low, but we do not have a special evolutionary theory. We have a more global evolutionary theory that um, colder climates, for example, uh, have a more demanding um, or are more demanding, are more um, difficult to, um, or more have higher challenges. And these challenges um, um, by colder climates are possible to be met by cognitive ability. Uh, for example, if people live in a colder climate, it is called winter theory. It is necessary to see the future, to plan. You need um, to be prepared for the winter when you cannot, when you have much less access to food, when you cannot um, make rice farming or wet farming and so on. You have to, to store food. You have to be prepared with, um, uh, uh, with clothes. You have to be prepared with houses, uh, fire and so on. And if you, and this, these are all cognitively um, um, demanding tasks. Task. So yes, the, the, these are all tasks with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, which you can better solve with um, higher in intelligence. This is a one theory, the cold winter theory, but it's not a special theory for Africa, but it's a, a global uh, theory. Yes. All right. Let, let, me ask you, let me ask you something. Um, when, uh, when I, as a white researcher, are they, is saying that, um, I, when I am are saying that an average, there's an average Africans have a, have a um, lower um, intelligence level, lower IQ, let, give, let me give you some numbers between um, 70 and 80, you feel um, hurt when I say as a, as a white man to you, as a black man, um, uh, about this, or what is your opinion about this? I know I am not emotional. I am quite low in empathy, and I am driven by data. So when you argue that on average blacks are less intelligent, I can mm -hmm. listen to the data and then go and eat ice cream. It is not my problem. I am not mm -hmm. very emotional. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about other people who think that when 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 I or other people are saying? that uh, Africans on average have a low ability, uh, cognitive ability level, and this is, um, and other people feel 
um, attacked about such a statement? What do you think about this? I think that the people who object to the research that you have been exploring are just stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a very clear message and now continue with the interview. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Einar, we have been speaking for what, over one hour. So briefly, I am going to be promoting your book. So you have written an interesting book called Cognitive Capitalism. Tell us why should we buy it? <laughs> Thanks, look, let me. Mm -hmm. Here's the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but you're going to US... speak for few, just for a few seconds because we're wrapping up. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, all what we are speaking in our interview is summed up in, in this book mm -hmm. and in a much better um, um, uh, founded way in which, which many references to the, to the uh, publication of other researchers with many references to data which, um, explaining the methods and so on. If you want to go deep into data and deep in the, in the knowledge and understand what are the background it is and what are the arguments you should look in this book. All right. So Einar, thank, thank you for showing up and we'll always correspond again, but unfortunately I have to say bye. So see you yeah. some other time. Bye. No, let me, let me express my gratitude Great. and I'm really impressed about your knowledge. Level. All really, right. Thanks really a lot. Impressed. All right. But this is, this is, you I know have to so go. much and you know all the you know all the relevant research and i'm very i would be very happy to be again um your guest in the show in your future all right then okay maybe maybe we could write a paper together <laughs> let, let us see all right mm -hmm.